So um, the first virology lecture I went to, the professor said that it's hard to be charismatic when you have a cold. So I want you to know I'm normally quite charismatic, but I just have a cold right now. <laughs> but if you can hear me in the back, um, that's all I want to get through. So um, what I want you all to understand is um, I want you all to take control of your health records. I want to start by the story. So there's a really good book um, that I've been reading. Uh, if I can just get through, I, I think I'll just flick this way. So it's, this is about the history of um, people's understanding of bees. Right, so it was only until the 18th century that people began speaking about the queen bee rather than the king bee, because they couldn't understand that the female could be in control of so many bees. Uh, but the thing is, the female always was in control. It just took us a while to understand it. So I want you to understand that <laughs> the patient is already in control of their health care and the healthcare care system. Um, just most of us don't know it yet. I want to overwhelm you with evidence about that. So um, just think back the last time you went to a doctor's appointment or you accompanied somebody you loved to their doctor's appointment. So um, hands up if you had to tell the person you're in front of something you'd already told to somebody else. So repeat a story to a doctor. Okay. Um, hands up from those people uh, if any of you were a little bit worried the, person, the doctor you were talking to didn't know what was going on. Okay. Um, and the reason is they don't know what's going on. And the reason is... <laughs> Um, it's not because they're not smart and they're not hardworking. They're, they're just tremendous, dedicated professionals. It's just the miracle of modern medicine is built on specialization. Right? So all these amazing treatments and therapies are possible because uh, doctors become more and more specialized. So they know more and more about less and less of you. So who's the only person who knows about every single little bit that involves the patient? Well, it's the patient who's left to join up the healthcare system. Uh, and so because of that, um, we just think it's the best thing to just let the patients take control of the records. Because when they do, uh, this is a, a report by the Young Foundation on Social Enterprise, and they kind of featured this earlier this year. And what they're saying is that basically giving patients control of their record is like in the 1980s when uh, you gave council tenants their houses. Right? So not only is it a massive transfer of asset wealth where these uh, renters now became property owners, but the new property owners take better care of the property than the former employees. Right, because their house, they live in it, and it's your health, you live in it. So you will take better care of your records than the medical professional ever can. Okay. So I'm going to go through just why I'm telling you this, why am I kind of obsessed with this problem. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you what our company does with different people um, for their health. Uh, and then people often ask us, how did we get there? So I'm going to tell you the story of how we get there, and I'm going to finish on uh, to-dos. Okay. Uh, so my background, um, I trained as a doctor and a programmer. I'm basically a geek, and I just love the possibility of technology in healthcare. Um, but I'm also, I've, I've got a, a rare condition, um, a genetic immune deficiency. So I'm a one in a million, but in a bad way. And what I was noticing is that when I get to my doctors and nurses, they would ask me what to do next. Initially, I thought, that's great. I've gone to medical school. They trust me. Had nothing to do with that, because my mother went through the same thing when she was bringing me up. And the reason was, I was the only one who had gone to all the appointments. So they would just ask me what happened when you saw the other guy, or actually one of them asked me what happened when I saw you six months ago. Just like walk me through what you got. So when they'd given me the results, I could be really helpful. If they hadn't, I couldn't. So I just got frustrated and said, you know, I really want um, to be able to help everyone and help myself. Um, and kind of the, I've, I've written seven books about using IT in healthcare. And I guess the, the common guiding theme for me is uh, just if you put, if you grab off the shelf cheap technology and put it in the hands of people doing the work, you can just do amazing things through de decentralization. So going through medical school, I was just obsessed with uh, handheld computers, just 100 pounds, and you, just, you have a beautiful computer that you can do things with. So I wrote a book that taught um, doctors how to use it. Then I taught them how to use smartphones. And then I even taught chefs. Um, I would talk to anyone about handheld computers. These things are so <laughs> cool uh, to have. Um, so what happens when people use our software? Um, so uh, we're the only company that's inside the National Health Service Secure Network, um, so we can start collecting data on behalf of the patient, but we're available to the patient outside of the network. So we always say it has to work on a mobile phone, a smartphone, or on a Nintendo Wii. Just whatever the patient has, any web browser, anywhere in the world, you can use the software. And the first people that came to us were Great Ormond Street Hospital. So this is uh, Europe's top children's hospital. And basically, you care for children, uh, actually from all over Europe and the Middle East, um, but obviously a lot, most of them are from the UK. And it's very complex conditions, and they need to coordinate so many things. So the hospital in London, the local hospital for the uh, family, uh, the community nurses, the GP surgery, 
sometimes the teacher to the child, sometimes the social workers for the family, uh, and always the uh, private company that delivers the medicine to the patient's home. And there is no system. I mean, you might think of a system that should do London hospitals. It doesn't exist. But even London doesn't exist, much less connecting up the hospital in London with the local GP surgery, much less the social workers or the teachers or the private. There is nothing that's top down that does it. So we said, flip it upside down. Give it to the patient. Everybody, all of you guys, give everything you have to the patient. What does the patient want? They want to give it all back to all of you guys because they just wish you guys would talk to each other. And so they will connect up the whole system. Uh, and so that's what they started doing. Uh, UCL started uh, last week. So they're doing this with asthma patients where they give them the complete treatment plans. Uh, and now we're doing things with the research. So you can begin to gather massive amounts of data that you can power the, treat uh, the development of the next generation of drugs. OK. Uh, so what does it look like for the patient? So they get a website that they're told that uh, your doctor and nurse think this is really important for your health. Um, and they're asked to just sign up for the website. And you register. And you take, uh, do an informed consent form. So um, you actually have to take a test to say, do you understand now you're in control of your record? So you've got rights, but also responsibilities. You've got to look after this thing. Uh, and then you show your photo ID. And at that point, you are legally and verifiably in control of your record. So everyone downstream in the healthcare system can trust what you're creating. So you log in. And the first time you log in, it's, uh, it's fairly empty, so just two buttons. You can invite uh, any doctor or nurse anywhere in the world. And we say to patients, it's a bit like Facebook, so add a friend, add a doctor. You can't poke your doctor, but it's the same idea of just building your own uh, mini social network if everyone is looking after your health. Uh, and then you can start discussions. So um, patients are pretty good at figuring out who's going to solve their problems. So when to talk to the doctor, when to talk to the nurse, when to talk to the secretary. Now, the beauty is that whatever they're saying with one member of the healthcare system is visible to everyone else. So when you say something to your hospital uh, team, your GP can finally see what's going on. Um, and if you say it to your GP, your community nurse can see what's going on. It's just really powerful for... Uh, health. We also have uh, a formal consultation feature. So at 3 o'clock in the morning, you can say, um, you know, I've got a particular symptom. Uh, by the way, if you've got chest pain at 3 o'clock in the morning, please call 999. Do not go on the computer and type stuff in. But in general, <laughs> non-emergency things. Um, and there are many problems that are non-emergent, but you would like an answer from your doctor, the one who knows you and has a relationship with you. Uh, and so you type in the problem you've got at 3 o'clock in the morning. And the software kind of walks you through every single question that doctor and nurse would have wanted to ask you if you were in clinic with them. It takes about 10 minutes. Um, but what generates at the end is kind of something that the doctor is really used to reading. It's in the format they, how you, they would want you to tell the story. So about a quarter to two-fifths of patients, that's all you need. The history is enough for the clinician to take an action for you. Um, and the remaining cases, you've already saved them 10 minutes of asking you questions. Um, and actually, uh, you know, instead of scribbling something down that nobody else can read, you've done all the writing for them because the software has created a perfect set of notes for them. And so when they hand over to somebody else, everything's there available. And uh, so I'll hand you to the specialist nurse who will look after you. The, all the notes are there. So it's really powerful for everyone. Um, you can then begin to tra track uh, medication. So we're now beginning to track compliance because about 50% of medicines are not taken like they're supposed to be taken. And there's a number of reasons for that. But the biggest problem is you don't, the patient doesn't admit that they're not taking the medicine. So um, that's the f you know, admitting the first step. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, everyone can find out, well, is it the side effects? Did you not train you? And so we go through that. So we begin to track that information. And then this is why I started the company. I just want my own test results. Um, so I've got hyper IgM. My IgM is high. And so not only will we give you the result, but we want to explain to you what IgM is. And then if it's high or low, we want to explain to you uh, what your doctor is thinking about. We don't diagnose. Your clinical team does. But... Uh, we want you to read what's going on before you come for the appointment. Um, because when you do, um, you can come prepare with your questions. And the conversation is, OK, doctor, what are we going to do? Because I now have information so I can have a decision with you. Uh, and that's how patients know best. We kind of want to raise the game of the patients so they can understand their record and then take part in the decisions about their health care. This is what you is doing. They're giving the treatment plan to the patients and teaching them what to do about their asthma. Um, and officially, um, this is because patients get quite confused about all the different inhalers. It's quite complex regimens, and they want to teach them what to do. Um, I began, it, I had, had a sneaky feeling over the last month, and I'm kind of just getting confirmed. The other person they're trying to teach is the GPs, because there are th 30 different asthma medications just for asthma. And then the GP is treating diabetics and cancer patients, and it's just really confusing. So this was a non-confrontational way of teaching the GP, because they're just teaching the patient, right? 
but the patient will go and tell the GP, this is my hospital gave me, and they can just read that. So it's a really nice way of raising the game of everyone in the system. Thank you. Uh, and then now you can start doing research. So as all this data is being chipped in by the patient, the medical professionals, and everybody else, you can start analyzing that and just understanding what's going on in the healthcare system and how to create the next generation of um, treatments. OK, so um, people often ask me, uh, how, how did we kind of get there? And, and, the, and the reason is basically we just have an amazing group of people involved. So our chairman is the former editor of the British Medical Journal. Um, you know, our developers, you know, each of them has been obsessed with this problem for years. You know, the one guy who joined, when he, when he kind of just sent me an email, he, he'd basically been working for eight years and had to track patients taking medicines, doing all in his spare time. I was like, Juan, why, why are you doing this? And he said, I just think it's important. And so we just have this people who are all obsessed about doing this. But I'm just going to spend the next few minutes telling you kind of how I got here and the things I've learned that allowed me to take part in the company. So um, the first thing I learned, which is quite early in medical school, is just build on what other people have built before you. So, um, you know, at the end of my first year of medical school, I got a job as a software developer. And um, I was really excited. I was kind of telling my boss, give me more work. I won't, I've only got three months before medical school starts again. So give me more jobs. And in frustration, one day said, fine. And he takes me to the radiology department. There's four uh, radiology professors. And he says, um, OK, guys, go for it. So they start saying, well, um, we have the DICOM file, and we need to annotate the DICOM file, and crop the DICOM file, and then distribute the DICOM file, and then have the student look at it. And I don't know if, you know, if you guys have any questions, but I just started thinking, what the hell is DICOM? I don't know what they're talking about. But they kind of said at the end, and here is the DICOM format. And they gave me a stack of pages. Um, we'll see you in a month. And so um, fortunately, a week beforehand, um, a friend of mine introduced me to this website called google.com. I just began kind of searching of, DICOM, by the way, is the file format for radiology images, so your x-rays, your CT scans. Um, it's quite obvious in retrospect, it's room for a radiologist, that's what they care about, but <laughs> I didn't have an idea at the time. So I found this open source software that someone had built that takes a DICOM file and puts it in memory uh, as an image. And then another bit of software that takes an uh, image file in the memory and lets you crop it, crop it, annotate it, and so on. So I just stitched them together and made some modifications for radiology. But within two weeks, this thing was working. My boss thought I was a genius. And I said, look, um, this, this bit of open source and this bit of open source, and he goes, that's fine, but you, you've got it done in two weeks. And so everything I've done is basically, instead of uh, the traditional or the instinct that many people have in software, which is let's build everything from scratch for ourselves, is people far smarter than me have done far more, so let's build on that. So, um, when I was writing a book in the States about um, how hospitals are sharing information with patients, um, I kind of realized actually the best country in the world is to start this is the UK. So uh, internet and mobile phone usage in the UK was higher than the USA. Uh, and then if you're talking about computer usage with patients, so computer, uh, if you look at GP surgeries in the UK, this is back in 2002, 95% um, of GPs were using computerized records with their patients. In the States, it was 5%. Right, so the infrastructure is here. And then you have the NHS, which is they have to take care of the same patient over years and decades. So they have the right incentives to do the right thing for the long term rather than just this year's insurance plan. So I just thought this was the, the, the place to, to start doing this. Um, then I, kind of, I have this strategy called Trojan Mice. So basically, um, you know, I, when I was writing that, that book, I, I, this was part of working at a company in the USA, a management consultancy. And the first day I joined, um, they had this party. It wasn't for me, it was just uh, kind of having a general party. <laughs> but uh, the first five people I met kind of said it was really spooky. They said the same thing to me, which is, you're that doctor who knows how to program. Maybe you can solve this problem. So we need a knowledge management system because we're a management consultancy, but we're not managing our own knowledge. But for three years, they've been stuck. They keep having missed meetings, and none of them can make a decision on what to do. So maybe you can get us one. So what I did was, um, first of all, I kind of found this uh, open source system hosted somewhere else, and I just began using it for myself and my colleague, the two of us did it. And then I kind of went to my boss and said, um, I need to do this for the whole team of five. I need $25 per month. Can I do that? And he goes, I don't want you to even discuss it. Fine, just have $25. It's nothing. Uh, and so we get it up and running for the five people. And we, um, it's, it's not perfect, but it's really good for our team. Um, and so another team hears about it, and they say, can we do the same thing? So I teach each of the five people how to do it. For, I said, you just have to get me $25 from your boss. So they do it. Uh, and so suddenly, uh, over the next year, I, I basically trained groups of five, individually, 300 people I trained one by one. Each of them would get 25 bucks from their boss. And suddenly, 30% of the company was using this every day. And they were just, no, no one was going to let get, this thing was just 
perfectly built for what they're all doing. And you know, after a year, it's obvious um, they're just going to have to use this for the whole company. But it was because um, we'd built it perfectly from the ground up for every single team, and then every single team guides the next iteration. We just made it, the decision was always a very small one, and we perfected it for that team. And so that's what we do here. I mean, I still um, I still sit down with secretaries and watch how many times they click. I count the clicks. Because every single person um, in these pilots must be happy. The doctor must save time, the nurse must save time, the secretary must save time, and of course the patient must improve their lives. But we kind of get really down in the details. The system's not perfect, but we just started off getting, understanding everyone's workflow and perfecting it for them in their small teams. Um, and then, you know, to go back to the PDAs, I just love the ability to uh, use technology so that people doing the work can just do it without having to get central permission, or much less a central budget or resources. Uh, so, um, I mean, when I was um, first few days on the wards, the junior doctor, I kind of had my PDA, and I kind of began seeing the, um, the, the problems around. So I, bit, I wrote this software that uh, lets, uh, the biggest problem I had was um, the handovers, so bet shifts between doctors. It's very, um, I'm probably going to scare you when I tell you this, but it's not very organized. <laughs> and so, um, I just wanted to be better done, and so I wrote this bit of software and kind of open sourced it. And just the data travels encrypted, but it's between two doctors in a corridor that can just do it. They don't have to have, go through a central database. Um, and so I just began convincing doctors, hey, buy buy your PDA for 100 pounds, and I'll give you the software, and we can start doing this. So everyone began buying their PDA, and we just began doing handovers, and it was just beautiful. And the, it was only at the very end of the year, kind of the CR began hearing, so whoa, what's happening in my hospital? Because basically everyone who's doing the work just got on and did the work. Uh, and so this is what we promise for doctors and nurses. So um, you can be productive within one hour with your patients. Um, you don't have to get permission because we've gotten the permission for you already. We've complied with all the security requirements and we've done all the legal uh, compliance. So if you want to do this with your patients, you can get going within one hour. And then when you prove your success and your colleagues prove their success, then we'll go up to the top again and say, okay, let's do this for the whole hospital. Or now people are asking us to do things for the whole region. So. Um, this is, uh, I mean, this is an example of this happening. This is a particularly important story for me because I remember when I was going for, uh, up to my 18th birthday being handed over from pediatric care to uh, adult care. And it was really stressful for me. Um, not because of my medical team. They kind of just did everything they could. It's just um, I'm ill and I'm a grumpy teenager and it just sucks to be ill, right? So it's a tr it's stressful transmission, uh, transition, I'm sorry. Um, a month ago, and this is coming out in today's garden, I think. So a month ago, Great Ormond Street Hospital, which is a pediatric institution, began working with St. Mark's, and basically the two doctors who work for children with gut problems said, you know what, the handover between us, we can just do it better. Uh, and so they started with one lady who's just coming up to her 18th birthday. For the previous year, she'd been consulting with her Great Ormond Street team. She had control of her record. She'd been trained up to do everything. And so for her to transition to the, um, the adult doctor, three clicks, just gave him access, and he could see everything she'd been doing. He could see all her health and she could explain everything in her words, she had control of what was going on. So I'd like to think that just her transition was less stressful because she was in control of her health. Okay, so my to-dos. Um, we want to get a million patients control of their health records in the next three years. Uh, and what I'd like to ask each of you is, um, each of you either has an illness or knows someone you love has an illness, and that illness has a charity. Uh, so we're starting a campaign called My Health, My Records, where we're getting all the charities to come out and teach patients get a copy of your records. So I want you to just send an email or send a letter to your charity saying, please join the campaign, My Health, My Records, because we want to teach all patients to control over the records. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.